Hello and welcome to the Nature Unplugged podcast where we are all about inspiring wellness in the digital age. Let's get going. And welcome to the Nature Unplugged podcast, where we are all about wellness in the digital age. And, you know, one of the most important aspects of living well in the digital age, in my opinion, is to develop a spirit of play. And I want to be clear that not, not talking about video games or digital games or screen games, uh, talking about unplugged play, moving our bodies, getting outside. And our guest today, Stephen Jepson, is a world-renowned expert on health, wellness, and play. I'm so excited to have Stephen here. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. Awesome. And so before we jump into it, I want to just read, I have a a kind of brief bio. So I want to give our listeners um, kind of some of your background. I know we'll dive into it more, but just so if they're not familiar with you, they have a, they have some sort of an understanding. So Stephen Jepson was born on May 31st, 1941 in Sioux City, Iowa. After receiving his MFA from Alfred University in 1971, he went on to open his studio in Geneva, Florida, and began the ceramics department at the University of Central Florida, where he taught for eight years. While Jepson continues to teach pottery, he is now retired and has dedicated himself to health, wellness, and athletic inventions. His life-changing program, Never Leave the Playground, has has improved the lives of people all over the world. Uh, Stephen, again, I'm so excited. I'm a big fan. You're a, a you know hero to me, motivational person for me for sure. And um, yeah, I'm just really pumped to have you. So, anything? I know that's a short bio, but anything you want to add to that before we we dive in? Um, people frequently ask what I do, and uh, and so for, I've been doing it for years and years. But a- after you finish this introduction part, I will read something that I wrote just re- fairly recently that really pinpoints pretty much exactly what I do. Perfect. Okay, let's jump into it. Yeah, go ahead and. You're ready. If you're ready to read that that introduction part, I would I would love to hear it. I will. I I will. I'll go ahead. This is what I believe to be true, and my response to it, as hunter gatherer scavengers for most of the last two and a half million years, our main goal from the day of our birth was to gain the skills necessary to survive to sexual maturity, so that we could cast our genetic material into the future. Each of us was self-reliant and capable of myriad things, from making our own clothing to getting enough to eat. We made constant use of our survival skills. We used our survival skills all of our lives. Modern humans seem to have some kind of memory for this flurry of ancient motor skill training because of the behavior that modern children exhibit today including jump rope, hopscotch, jacks, ball games, monkey bars, bicycling, ring toss, swimming, dancing, skateboarding, skiing, horseback riding, and on and on. Our bodies yearned for these various activities. We do it for years, and then we quit and become sedentary, a recipe for illness. I teach people to keep up the physical movement, the activity which continually enriches the brain and body. My games, playings, and toys do that continually honing physical skills while learning new ones. My program improves one's balance, stability, and coordination with attendant improvement in one's memory, creativity, mood, and much more. Keep moving in fun, creative ways all of your life. That's it. I love, I love that. I love that. That's very well said. And I think it uh, you know, succinctly kind of talks about what you do. And you, know, you mentioned in that little piece that you read uh, how we, you know, move, most of us just naturally move as kids and we play as kids. I'm curious to hear, you know, um, you know, a big part of what we talk about in the podcast is, is connection with nature and getting outside. And when you were a kid, was, you know, was there a particular place in nature that you really loved? And, you know, I'm curious how like your time as a kid playing outside inspired you. Okay. Well, first of all, I will begin with a little story about when I was very young, and then I will 
talk about something that happened when I was eight years old that has led to all of this pretty much today that we're going to talk about. And um, when I when I was three years old, my father built a an enclosure around the sandbox, a little a little fence around the sandbox, and okay. I would extend my arms above my head, and he would grab me around the forearms and lift me up and put me by the sandbox. And when and and there I would be with my toys at three years old in the summertime. It was wonderful. But my ba- father or mother would come back in a half an hour, and I was gone. I had escaped. <laughs> and then when I was four years old, they, uh, they had a little dog harness that they put on me with a, a, a metal ring in the back, and they would hook me, tether me to the clothesline, and put me under the clothesline with all of my toys, and it, I was in heaven. I could go and play, and it was heavenly, and they would come back in a half an hour or an hour expecting me to be there, and I once again, I was four, and I had escaped, and so at five, my father gave me a wristwatch, and he said, when the long hand points straight up at 12 and the little hand points at six down at 6 PM every, every night you will be home for dinner. That mm-hmm. is the only rule I had growing up and period. And at five years old, my father turned me loose on the, I was turned loose on the world. They wow. could not contain me without being cruel to me. They would have had to chain me to a table or lock me in a room or a closet because I was going to get away because I was so curious about what was beyond my sight, what I couldn't see. But if I just went there, I could see and I could know. That's amazing. Anyway, That's amazing. And, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. And it seems like uh, you're now, I don't think I mentioned this, but you're 80 years old today. Is that correct? Maybe? Yes. Yes. And, and it seems like, I mean, uh, that you still have that same uh, spirit of of curiosity, of play, of adventure that you did as a uh, you know three and four year old and five year old <laughs> escaping the, the sandbox. It's pretty amazing. Right. Well, when I was eight years old, 1949, my father got me up about two o'clock in the morning and took me down uh, in Sioux City, Iowa, down to where the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey train had come to the, the circus came to town in a train. And at two o'clock in the morning, they began to unload that train, all the animals and they and the uh, they. they they just, uh, everybody in the whole circus was working. And finally, the last thing they did was using the elephants and everything, pull up the big top. And this wow. took uh, for maybe a couple of hours. And then my father took me home. And then later in the afternoon, my mother and father uh, took me to this. I saw a circus live for the first time in my life. And I was sitting on a seat and I watched uh, from behind the curtain. Here comes uh, a guy on riding on something with one wheel under a unicycle. I saw that for the first time in my life live. And wow. I thought to myself, I was eight years old. And I said, Hmm, I can do that. And I can today. And I teach it. And then a little <laughs> while later, uh, uh, some guys came out and they were juggling and I'd never seen that live before. And I thought to myself, well, I can do that. I can learn to do that. And I can, and I teach it. And then a little while later, a guy, Rolando the Great, came out, a little guy in a, with a cape on and, and tights, and, and he, do, he took his cape off and he scampered up a ladder, up so he was quite high off the ground, and he got up and he tightrope walked. And for the first time in my life, I saw that, and I thought to myself, well, I can learn to do that. And I got a tightrope set up here at the studio, and I teach it. And then we went to a sideshow at the circus, and there was a man throwing knives, and I thought, hmm. I can do that. I can learn to do that. And I can, and I teach it. I throw, li- I throw <laughs> knives like the man in the circus. Anyway, that's how, the, because my niece said to her father, my brother, he said, people are just going to think Stephen fell off the back of a circus truck. No, 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 that's not true at all. I just, I found out all these interesting things to try to do during my life. And I just pursued it. Th- that's all. There is absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing unusual about me physically. My balance was not unusually well trained as a child. My, uh, I didn't have any of these skills as a child, but, um, I, I just took the time to learn all these various things. And then when I, uh, a a number of years ago, I read the CDC figures on people over 65 falling down and breaking a hip Mm -hmm. and that that's what led to all this. I thought I can help them. I can help them. 
and because of how well my balance is trained and the things I have used to do to train my balance. Anyway, yeah, it, when I go, when that, I'm up on stage, by the way, I don't walk, go into the room and say, well, well we're all going to learn to juggle today. No, no, no. I, I start with, first of all, I set up the problem. I, I set up the problem, but there are toys that I've come up with all over the stage and I, I, and they're marbles and different balls of different sizes and pieces of PVC and just different, very easy things for people to come up with. A roll of masking tape, for instance. Um, I tell my audiences, you too can tightrope walk, and here's what we're going to do. And I take a roll of masking tape, and I say, just run this down the floor 20 feet in the garage, this piece of masking yeah. tape, and then walk on that. And I yeah. say, you're tightrope walking. <laughs> and walk on it sideways and walk on it backwards and walk on it toe to toe. In yeah. other words, constantly, 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 after you've learned to do something easy, begin to ramp up the difficulty. And I right. tell my audiences, the first 500 times you do something new physically, uh, motor skill training type thing, you are changing the brain in the first 500 times more dramatically than you're going to change it from 500 to 10,000. In other words, it's when you learn to do something new physically that makes these gargantuan changes, is supercharged in the changes it makes in the brain. Yeah, I love that. I love that, Stephen. And I think that you brought up a few really good points. I think because one of the challenges of the, this platform, the podcast platform, is that it's audio and people can't see you and see what you do. So we'll definitely link your some of your videos, your YouTube videos and things like that, because you are, uh, it's pretty incredible to watch your balance and your skills. And I think it's a really important piece that you said that you're not like a superhero circus person. You are a you know normal person who has spent a lot of time <laughs> training these uh, I think what's unusual is you, the time and, and attention you put in and the curiosity that you put into training these things. But I think it's a really great and important point that, you know, I think a lot of people would look at you and say, well, there's no way I can do that. You have some sort of, you know, genetic, uh, you know, no, 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 no. supernatural you're, you're thing. You're but dead it's not, on. Yeah. Sebastian, yeah. you're dead on. You're totally correct. And when I'm speaking in front of an audience, I, I take something, uh, for instance, uh, I have PVC. I have PVCs in various diameters, various lengths, from very, very short to to up to two feet long. And I dip one end in black paint, and okay. then, so when I'm standing with uh, with these pieces, different pieces of PVC, I've got one end is dipped in black paint, so I always know where one end is that when I throw it up in the air. So the first thing I do is train myself to do the half turn. In other words, mm -hmm. go from the black end to the white hand, end over and over and over and over with each hand. I train my body totally, totally bilaterally, symmetrically. In other words, if ever I teach myself something to do new with my right hand, I teach myself to do it with my left hand. Every morning of my life in the kitchen, I stand up, I'm pouring boiling water with my dominant hand. I'm standing <laughs> on one foot and I'm stirring and I'm stirring with my non-dominant hand every yeah. morning of my life. It's amazing. Anyway. You know, this morning I, I was, this is a little inspiration, but you know, I was, um, I was like, okay, I'm getting ready for my, my interview with Steven. I'm so excited. And I, br I thought about this and I'm like, I brush my teeth with my non-dominant hand. I was like, you know, it's probably something Steven does every once in a while is, is just, it's well, so I did it this morning. Oh. <laughs> I did it this morning. <laughs> it's amazing. Let me ask you this. You spoke a little bit about the, the first 500 times you do something, it's really incredible for our brains and, and for creating these these new connections and, and circuits. Can you just talk a little bit more about the impact of, of play in our brains and our, and our memories and you know, play and new movement and things like that? Right. For, first of all, when I, my, never need the play, my never leave the playground thing is about movement and activity. It's not about it, that the, the, the kind of changes that that, re, that causes in the body, that that gives us. Uh, it's not about... Uh, the, the social aspect of the playground. In other words, that when I say never leave the playground, I am not talking about the social, the, it's all the physical stuff. And, and he, this is what I have come up with. You take a newborn baby, a day, it was born yesterday, and you put a, a towel on the table or a nice soft blanket, and you put that baby down on the table 
on its face on the blanket. And there it yeah. lays. We can't even lift our head up off the table the day after we are born. We can't do it. Okay, yeah. well, at two, we can, at, at uh, nine months, we can walk, begin most of us. At two, we can do all, all this and that. But as this newborn baby is going to now first lift its head up off the table, it's not going to learn it's not going to learn to play the violin. It's not going to paint. It's not going to learn language. The first thing we're going to do is learn to lift our head up off the table and then turn our head and then, and then um, begin to focus our eyes. Uh, we, uh, we're going to learn to turn over. And then we're going to learn to get up on our hands and knees. We're gonna, then we're going to learn to stand up at the edge of our crib. And then we're going to learn all of, of the learning uh, uh, that we go through the first part of our life. It's not language. It's not the violin. It's not right. painting and pottery making. It's learning physical movement. There is none of that other stuff. So I believe that everything that we learn subsequent to all this movement is, is related to that movement. It's hung on a matrix or lattice in the brain. That's a metaphor, uh, a pattern in the brain. Uh, language is, is in relation to movement in our brain. Everything mm. is pretty much in relation to movement in our brain. <laughs> That's what yeah. I think. No, I love that. And, and I think, you know, one of the things I've heard you say, um, you know, I, I want to talk about this because because when we're kids, of course, or young people, it's it's pretty natural to be out playing and moving and all those things. And then typically, you know, this happens, I think, at different times for different people, but we tend to slow down, right? Uh, you know, whether that's because of work. No, no, or, no, right? yeah. no, no. You got an 80 year old on the phone here who goes out on his shred sled, his scooter, <laughs> his C5 carver, his skateboard, his trike, his one wheel, his bike, and, and all around the studio, I, I, uh, I counted them up and, and I quit counting. I got 47 things that I could count around the studio, various games to my tightrope, my loose rope, my things to vault, my things to vault over. And I do very complicated things because I've been doing it for, for 75 years. I've been doing it. Right. But when up on stage, it's very, very easy for me to, to sit down. I have a chair and I sit down and I, I, I have a, a, a board, for, for, not a board, but a, a, a luncheon tray, a plastic, a plastic tray for the cafeteria. It's got a little, it's flat and it's got a little edge around the edge. And I put a tennis ball on it and I'm sitting down and I say, how many of you in the audience can keep this tennis ball on this tray? And it's got a, a boundary all around the outside. So things don't, when you just spill on it, it doesn't go off. And, right. and, and they all agree. And I say, and then I flip the board up and I've got lines drawn on it now. And then I say, well, how many of you now can uh, keep the tennis ball on those lines? And, and there's one that's a circle and that's very diff that's most difficult to do. But I encourage people to start doing things that are very, very easy. My, uh, I have taught people for the last 40 or 50 years of my life to teach people to do extremely difficult physical things in a way that that happens easily and, and is not stressful for people but pottery making for instance right I, I, my, my first I'm known across the world for pottery teaching actually uh, and I know that because of sometime when you know I'll, we're talking again I'll tell you why how I know that that around the world p people that speak can speak English know about my pottery teaching well, you have, but, and you have a piece in the Smithsonian. I didn't mention that. That's a, yeah, obviously yeah, a huge deal. Yeah, yeah, they bought a piece from me, and they agreed to buy nine more. They All agreed right. to buy nine more. Anyway, <laughs> by the way, I have three things that people can in your audience can begin to do instantly today that are almost free, to, that are free, that they that will absolutely, I guarantee, will change their lives. Okay, I'm, I'm in. I mean, I, I think I was going to ask you that. Well, you know, what can people kind of put into practice right away? For sure, yeah. What, what do you got? Immediately, they can begin to practice standing on one foot. And God, can you count or can look at your wristwatch? How long can you do it? And I want you, I want the people in the audience to stand in a doorway so they got the two sides to grab a hold of if they begin to lose their balance or next to a table or a chair. I don't want anybody suing us because they stood out in the middle of, a, of the street on one foot and fell down and broke their head. No, do it where you can grab something right. 
Baby or steps. Just, just start out with your hand flat on the table, lift up one leg, and then begin to play with that hand on the table. Play the piano with that hand or tap your fingers mm. on the table. Now lift your hand up off the table. Now you're standing on one foot. Do that frequently okay and the next thing is okay. uh, begin to use your non-dominant hand as much as you possibly can open doors pour pour milk pour water uh, uh use your non-dominant hand brush your teeth <laughs> flip pancakes pour boiling water whatever <laughs> use your non-dominant hand as much as you possibly can and the third thing is have a stand-up desk yeah i love that Okay, yeah. those three. Those I love three that. Things. Yeah. Okay. So it's stand on. So practice your balance. Stand on one foot. Use your non-dominant and you, hand and stand. Yeah. It. Yeah. That's it. And but 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 by what? But oh, uh, do I sit down to get dressed? I'm 80 years old. Oh, <laughs> that's another thing. People can go on the internet and say, "How will Stephen Jepson know when he's old?" And <laughs> it's going to make them laugh when they see this. Do I sit down to get dressed? I have an idea of what the answer is, but but you you share it with us. Probably not. No, no <laughs> I haven't sat down to get dressed since I ever. And I don't sit down. To, I put my shoes on standing up. I put my I I put my pants on standing up. And if I'm curious, if I think I'm gonna, there's going to be any chance of me falling doing anything, I stand in a doorway. I put my pants on standing in the doorway. I don't. I do, and sometimes, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, I can do it out in the middle of a, the street, but get dressed without touching something. But if I think, oh, I'm just got up, and <laughs> anyway, stand in a doorway, folks. If you're going to be testing your some of these things that this guy Jepson's talking about, yeah, <laughs> I know don't that... want anybody to fall down. Yeah, I know, <laughs> and I and I and I love it because I, and you spoke to this, but I think what's so cool about your program and your approach is that it's so accessible and it's fun, right? It's, it's like, I mean, you, you watch the, the videos of you and it's incredible what you can do, as I mentioned, and you're having, you're playing while you're doing it. You're having fun. It's like, I compare that. I think about that compared to a lot of folks, you know, not everyone who are like, you know, grinding it out in the gym, gym or on a treadmill. No, no, and no, it's work, no. So. <laughs> it's all fun. People, when yeah. they think about the gym, they think about arduous uh, work and, and sweatiness and all this. No, no, no. What I do is I introduce all sitting down, picking up marbles with their toes or stretching out a, a towel or something out in front of them. They can do this when they're watching TV or whatever. And then very slowly grab that, bunch that towel up with your toes and pull it back toward you or pick up marbles with each, with each foot singly and drop them in a bowl. Well, then I have people, uh, then I have people uh, stand up and pick up marbles and drop them in a bowl. Then I have them put the bowl up on a chair, standing up, pick up marbles, drop them in the bowl on the chair. Then I have them put the bowl up on a table. Now, standing up, I have them pick up mar marbles from the floor and drop them. In other words, I can, something simple like dropping marbles in a bowl, I can ratchet up the difficulty so difficult. Right. I, I, I have a, uh, one of the things I do with marbles is I have a board that's about 10 inches wide and exactly two feet long. And I put a book under one end and I pick up a marble with my right foot and I drop it at the top of this little ramp that I've created. And I quickly grab it before it rolls off the, off the end of the ramp with my left foot. And then I put it back at the top of the ramp with my left foot and I quickly grab it with my right foot. And that's just one book, and the little marble is going to go down the roll, down the ramp slowly. I can put several books under it so that nobody's going to be able to catch a marble coming off the ramp, at least the first few times. I can do it over and over. Another thing I do is I, I, put, I took a little p tiny bungee cord and took these little uh, containers, uh, little cans, and I made it so I could fasten a little can on the back of my foot, and I throw a, uh, a hacky sack up in the air, and I catch it on the back of my foot. I'm standing on one foot, and I catch catch this uh, hacky sack in the back, and I can catch uh, several of them in this little container that I have fastened to the back of my foot. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. You know, you're, I mean, you're obviously, you're an, you're, you're creative. You're, you're like, an, you're an inventor really of, of a lot of things. And I think about I to this, like, you know, uh, we work a lot with, with, with youth and there's a, you know, you may see this where you are a little bit, but there's a, a big issue with, um, you know, kind of a lack of creativity or never, like, you know, there's not that kind of creativity. There's not that, um, kids are typically kind of quite bored if there's not a game. I'm not talking about everyone, but certain kids, if they don't have their video games or they don't have their screens, 
get bored pretty quickly. And it seems like you've, 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 I think, harnessed that boredom and come up with all these amazing You are so dead things. on, Sebastian. Yeah. You are so, yeah, I ask my you. audience, any, anybody in the audience that here ever been bored? And the hands go up, almost yeah. everybody. You know, I said, life, I said, people, I said, life is boring to boring people. I said, you don't have any plans and dreams and hopes and schemes to be, to be thinking about when you're lined up at the grocery store or, 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 or ready to go in the concert or lined up someplace. You don't, you're not, you don't have an imagination. What? You're here listening to me talk about these, all these important things for your health. There, every, you're not a bunch of crowd of boring people. You've got hopes and dreams and plans and schemes and things that you can imagine and dream up You've got uh, an imagination. From now on, that's what you do. You just, I haven't been bored. Oh, when I was eight years old, this is another thing, a beautiful <laughs> summer day in Sioux City, Iowa. Okay. Um, I said, I'm going to hold the phone away from my, my, my voice. Hey, Mom, there's nothing to do. Could you hear that? Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah, yeah but I, I took the phone because I really yelled out. <laughs> and my mom says, son, your bed needs making. The lawn needs mowing and the trash needs carrying out. From that moment in time, I have never asked anyone else to come up with a thing for me to do. I will think of things for me to do. It's yeah, <laughs> it's it's really it's it's so it's so important right now. And I think it's such a huge, hugely important lesson for for not just kids, but for for everyone. I think there's just this. I, I think with the advancement of technology, there's some great things that come with that. But one of the things is we have all this information and all these little games on smartphones at the, you know, within our fingertips. And there's not that same creativity that happens like you're talking about, like putting marbles in a jar or or having the time for for the hopes and dreams and, and imagination, all those things. So I think you are, it's so refreshing to hear this, your approach. Um, you know, I want to talk about, you've talked about some of them, but um, can you share a little bit more about maybe like two or three more of your, your favorite uh, inventions, kind of like your favorite, your favorite movement games that you've, you've come up with? Well, this, uh, this, what I call flip sticking, this uh, things with the, the PVC with one end dipped in black. One of them is four or five inches in diameter and it's only four inches long and one end is dipped in black and it's a lot different when you throw it up in the air to catch the, uh, to do the 180, 180 degree turn or the 360 degree turn to catch the black end or the white end. It's a lot different than doing something eight inches long that's a one inch piece of PVC. And another thing I do with PVC is all my PVC, I got a hole drilled in one side and okay. I pick it up with my, with my right hand and I, never letting it leave my right hand. I don't throw it up in the air and spin it. I turn it with my fingers and I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. clockwise turns with my right hand. One, two, three, four, five, ten. with my uh, right hand, uh, clock, counterclockwise turns. And then I go over to my left hand and I go one, two, it's same thing, first to the right and then to the left turns. And, and I time it. And I did, uh, I don't know, it took me two, two minutes and some odd seconds or something to do it the first time. But it, 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 it's, you, that's what people are going to find out is about these little games and playings and things that Jepson does is that, first of all, it enriches the brain and they're going to come away jacked up uh, uh, like as, almost as though they've taken a drug that, it, that enhances them, that makes them feel richer inside and 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 enriches their brain and their body and i come away high this from doing these all these things and my memory has gotten absolutely outstanding i'm 80 years old oh that's another thing regarding memory yeah um, yeah talk to uh, me about that because it does i i, I want to make a point of that too because when i when i talk we've talked a few times um we're on different coasts you know you're in florida i'm in california but we talked on the phone a few times and when i talk to you i feel like i'm like it's there's there's this intensity and energy that is like it's like a drug but it's you know it's like it's like being just in full engagement with life and with curiosity but keep going what talk to me about how this is impacting okay them. okay yeah. and then i've got that ramp and i build all these balance oh, boards and i build or no jeff steven steven i want to sorry you were before that i interrupted you but you were talking about how it's impacted your memory I want to hear. Oh, it. and my creativity. Yeah, 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 yeah. First of all, my mother was a, a formal PhD in uh, uh, creativity. She taught with Alex Osborne and uh, Sidney Parnes. 
not names that you know probably, but they were at Buffalo with one of the the, the absolute great uh, creativity guys in the world. And my mother wrote her doctoral thesis on bringing out um, uh, creativity from children and adults in a classroom setting. My mother was a foremost expert in all the world on bringing, helping people become more creative. Wow. And I lived with this woman from the time I was born until <laughs> I went off to college. And she's the one that said, son, your bed needs making, the lawn needs yeah. mowing. And, <laughs> and so from that moment on, and regarding my creativity, <laughs> all this stuff causes me to, and then I go in the house and I sit down and because of all these things I've just been doing, this uh, there's this flush of things to think about and new things to do and that's what it causes. That's what it brings on in me. I don't know what it's going to bring on in your audience, but I can pretty much give, I guarantee people a longer, healthier life. Yeah, in my is, audience, yeah. uh, if they're, they're just, I can't be talking to one person to do it. But when I'm talking to an audience of six or seven, and I've talked to audiences of 954, then I have statistics and science on my side because yeah. science demonstrates, proves that movement is key to physical health. You, we we talked about it earlier. People think, oh, oh, you you grow old and then you slow down. No, no, no. You slow down and then you grow old. When I was 16, I thought, mm, I'm going to grow old and I'm going to sit on the front on a rocking chair on the front porch and I'm going to watch the children with this in the swing and playing with the dog in the yard and that's what I'm going to do. No, no, no. You've got to be out there playing with the kiddos. You've you got be to be there. enriching. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I agree. I'm, I'm just, I, I just was re agreeing with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. <laughs> got to be out there. Tell, it's tell crucial. Us about, yeah. Yeah. I, Steven, I love it. Tell, can you, can you share with us about, um, uh, where people can find your, your pro your, uh, never leave the playground programs that on, that's on your website. Yeah. Yeah. Never leave the playground.com. And, and they can invite me, they can invite me to come to their organization or group or whatever, and I'll come and share all of what I have learned and all of what I know, but, I, but it was all precipitated by this, uh, CDC figures on 65 year olds. And I asked my gal who has seen my talk many times and has videoed it. I said, baby, who is this talk for? And she says, Stephen. It's for everyone from six until 96. It's for everyone. Your message is for people to keep moving in fun, creative, interesting ways. I love it. I love it. And I, I completely agree. It's not, it's not just for people 65 and up. It's not just for, you know, it's, it's, this is a universal message that believe me, you know, we work, as I mentioned, work a lot with, with kids. And, and this is a, a, a hugely important message for, for kids to be, to be out moving more and getting outside and getting more creative. So it is a, it's a message for everyone and for parents, of, of course, as well. Um, okay. So I'm going to link all this stuff on the, sh in the show notes on our website, if it is, it is www.neverleavetheplayground.com. And there's lots of resources and you have, and you have videos on there. You have all sorts of, all sorts of wonderful things. Um, oh, that's real kind for you to say, have we talked for five minutes yet? <laughs> time is, I don't, I, I don't even know. I think, I think we're just about out of time. I think it's, it's, but I could talk to you all day. I mean, we've had a few, we've had a few calls. Okay. Well, well, but, but let me tell you about, let me tell you something yeah, that, that's absolutely key to this whole thing. I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Astronauts go out into space and they've been doing it for years now. And a woman, Dr. Joan Vernikos, who has written wonderful, wonderful books on movement. And she wrote the book, Sitting Kills moving heels. And years ago, she wrote me, she didn't know me. This woman's in her mid eighties now, or almost 90. She's just the sweetest, kindest woman, but she rehabilitated the astronauts when she came back from space. But years ago, she wrote me an email and the email was, wow, there've been great big letters across the page and at the bottom and smaller letters. You are the epitome of everything I have been teaching for the last 30 years. Okay. So we go out into sp astronauts, go out into space. Do you know what happens when astronauts go out into space? I mean, not exactly, but I know that, you know, we need the gra we need gravity, right? So there's also, yeah, yes. we about. age, we age 
in excess of 10 times the rate that we age uh-huh. here on Earth with this uh-huh. astronauts when they go out in space. So if you go out in space for six months, you're going to age for uh, two, two and a half, uh, uh, 10 times that amount. If you go out uh-huh. in space for a year, you're going to come back 10 years older with, uh, or in excess of that with, uh, bone, with uh, bone wasting, muscle wasting, and so forth. Okay, the astronauts come back from space, and they get out of that little spa- thing that they came back to Earth in, and they can't even walk. They're put wow. in a wheelchair or a gurney and wheeled away. They can't even walk. Okay, and then these astronauts who were in excellent physical shape when they went out in space, they had to be. They were, they were handball players. They were hockey players. They were horseback riders. They were swimmers. They were marathon runners. They were on and on and on, bicycle riders in excellent shape. Okay, so they, they come back, and they're 10 years older, and they couldn't even walk. Well, what happens is, they go back to what they were doing when they were when they before they went out into space, and they completely get back into the shape that they were in when they went out into space. What is the implication of that? We can all reverse aging at any moment in time. This guy Jepson goes up on stage and he gets sees everybody. He tells them how they can turn back the clock. They can become younger day by day by day. And, and the thing regarding memory, this thing regarding memory, and people say, oh, my memory. The, here is what this guy Jepson says about memory. You, you go to a party uh, of adults. And at, at the home that you're at, the, the party, there's a, a 10-year-old little girl or boy that is kind of interesting. And you begin to talk to them, and they say, in my room, I've got a library, and I've got Ivanhoe, and I've got uh, Bobsy Twins, and I've got uh, Alice in Wonderland, and all these books, uh, 69 of them or whatever they've got. And you say, well, go get your Alice in Wonderland book. And they run into the room, and they grab it, and they come right back out with it. Okay, so here... You are at 38. Here I am at 80. Uh, we've got the Library of Congress in our head. And the reason that we can't immediately come up with whatever we, that it slips our mind is it has to do with retrieval. And there's so much there that retrieval is complicated. You and I, were when we were 13, we had a relationship with a little girl. And maybe she jilted us or maybe she went dancing with us or we had a wonderful experience. And you can remember that vividly for the next few days or or you had an accident, or you did something, painted this wonderful, or you had all this experience of the surfing or this and that, and you've forgotten about it today, but it, it'll pop back into your mind. In other words, we've got the Library of Congress in our head, <laughs> and things that we go through frequently, regularly, we can remember that easily, but things we haven't thought of for 15 years or 50 years or 25 years, it's more difficult to retrieve it. It's there, and that's why... When you try to come up with the name of I can Tina Turner or whatever, and you can't remember right away, uh, you're such a fool, but you know you're in love. I, I can remember th- <laughs> things. You don't even know this stuff, probably. But <laughs> I, I try to think of it, and then all of a sudden it will pop back into your mind because your mind just goes constantly through your brain. Boom, there it is, and it pops up. That's why that happens. It's there. But it's retrieval, people. Your, me- your memory is not getting worse. You have a wonderful memory. You can remember thousands, millions, and millions of things. It's just that you haven't thought about it for a long time, and that's the reason it takes for a while to come up with it. Right. Yeah. And the move, I think, yeah, and, and connection. Movement the helps. Galaxy, the movement, movement helps bring it back and make those new yes. connections. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's amazing. You know, I'm, I, as I mentioned, I could talk to you for – I could. Just talk to you for hours and hours and hours. Uh, you know, well, we, I've got to tell you, you are, what, you have me come on and do a week because I can talk about this for an hour or totally. I can talk about this for a day or a weekend or a week. I can do workshops on it. And by the way, I teach creativity. I teach lots of different things. But this is the most important thing that I teach is is movement. And I start I start people with very, very easy things they can do sitting down and I ratchet up the difficulty for them and all the way up and including covering one eye with a patch and that sort of thing, or do it blindfolded. Oh, that's another thing I do. Do you remember the name Yvonne Lindell? Probably you don't a tennis player. Yeah, I know Yvonne Lindell. I, I, I mean, I, I, 
It was before my time, but I'm big into tennis. So yeah, I know that name. I knew that name. Okay. Well. well, he used to, while he was waiting to serve, he would roll tennis balls right and left hand, right in circles in his hand, rotate mm. right, counterclockwise and clockwise, two tennis balls. And this was years ago. I saw this and I thought, well, I learned to do that with two tennis balls. Then I learned to do it with three tennis balls in both hands. And in my van, I have got, oh, six or eight pool balls. And when I'm driving out here to the studio, Always with my left hand, I have three pool balls, and I am rotating three pool balls right in uh, counterclockwise and clockwise all the way to, to the studio. I am looking through the windshield. I am driving my van. I am not looking at my hand. And I do this all the way out to the studio, and then going home at night, I switch to my other hand. All, all the way home, I go with my right hand. I did it with my left hand going out and my right hand going home. So I am constantly, constantly training my body to do, do these. And people, oh, then I can, and then when I'm up on stage, I have a bongo board there, and I stand on a bongo. You know what a bongo board is? Yeah, like a, like a balance board. Yeah, it's got a roller in the center. Yeah, and it's yeah, got, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can yeah. do, I can do, I can do uh, t- uh, pool balls in my right and left hand. B- this time I've got <laughs> in both, and I'm standing on a bongo board, and I'm 80 years old. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's really, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. People have to see this too to believe it. So I would definitely link the videos, Stephen. Stephen, um, you know, I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast. I'm, uh, I hope. You know, we can have you on again. And as we said, you know, it'd be great to have you out for, for a workshop or something like that. So this is to be continued. And we're going to, you know, we'll find a time to, we're going to go surfing, whether it's here in San Diego or, or out in Florida. I'm not a out. surfer, but you could give me some lessons. We, yeah, we can, or, you know, you know we'll, we'll surf, we'll do, we'll mix it up. But yeah, I really appreciate, appreciate you being on here. Again, we're going to have show notes, uh, all the show notes on our website. And Stephen's website, again, is www.neverleavetheplayground.com dot com okay. well Steven, i hope this yeah. adds to people's lives i just hope what i said is an, uh, just a little bit that adds to the quality the richness of people's lives but i guarantee that if they do the things the kind of the things and these are just the things i came up with in other words once people see the way i think about things they can come up with their own ideas to enrich their brain that are going to teach them to do new physical things they don't have to do what i do but once they see the way i think about it then it'll help them or they can do exactly what i do <laughs> anyway yeah, I no, teach no, people yeah, to do difficult it. physical things starting very, very easy. I make it easy for people to learn to do difficult, complicated things, physical things. Very well said. Very well said. Stephen, thank you so much. And thank you all for tuning in to the Nature Unplugged podcast. You can find our episodes on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, and other podcast platforms, basically wherever you wherever you want to listen to your podcast. We'd love it if you could take a moment to subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts. That helps us a ton. And be sure and check out www.natureunplugged.com for more information and resources. And as I mentioned, you can also find the detailed show notes along with links to Stephen's videos and his website. All that stuff will be, will be on our website. Thanks so much for tuning in and we will catch you next time. Like seasons out of our control If you think you should go I will let you go